to look over the horizon and wonder what's there. It's part of what makes us human. Even before we were fully human, some two million years ago, our early ancestors first left Africa for Asia. Long before the age of European exploration, ancient Polynesians in canoes spread throughout the vast Pacific. Phoenicians mastered the Mediterranean and Vikings crossed the Atlantic. 500 years ago, in 1519, Magellan set forth on the first successful voyage to circumnavigate the entire globe. And in the 20th century, humans reached the planet's highest peaks and its distant poles. With the invention of the airplane, a new era of exploration was launched. And about a generation after Lindbergh flew the Atlantic, we reached outer space and a vast new frontier. It was 50 years ago this summer that Apollo 11 emerged from a ball of fire streaking towards the moon with three men on board. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce, it is your pleasure to be in his presence, the command module pilot for the Apollo 11 mission, Mike Collins. Good to see you, pal. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mike. It's, it's really, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Miles. It's nice to be here at this uh, magnificent uh, festival. Yeah, it's a good crowd out there. I, I will commend uh, every, uh, the astronauts uh, on our program today, all three of them have written books. And with all due respect to the other two astronauts who will be here, Mike wrote the book on writing books on flying in space. His book, Carrying the Fire, which is now back out in print, Yes. Is, is a beautiful, eloquent tribute to space with great technical detail and, and a great sense of um, what the mission is all about. So uh, I, I recommend you read that. And one of the things you say in your book at the end, uh, which kind of struck me, is a mission like Apollo 11 is a mission that really never ends. Here we are 50 years later. You're still talking about it, and, and one of the, it, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse in some ways. You have to answer the same questions over and over again. So I need to know right out front, what's your least favorite question <laughs> that you get from the likes of me? What was it really like up there? <laughs> what was what really like up there? <laughs> So, Mike, then, what was it really like up there? <laughs> no, I, uh, it's interesting, that question, like you've been holding out or something. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But having said all that, uh, I know um, the three of you each have had a different approach, and, and I'm speaking of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Uh, it, it, there are times when you'd prefer not to talk about it, and there are times when you'd like to. Um, what's your feeling 50 years later? Now that you've had a chance to put a little time between you and the mission, how do you feel about re reliving it in some fashion for people like this? Well, I like to uh, talk about so many different facets up, you know, what's it like up there? What is what specifically? But I, I like to talk, I guess, uh, about Neil Armstrong a bit. Uh, uh, he uh, and Buzz uh, were remarkable crew members. They were, they were just wonderful. Uh, Neil was, um, I don't want to say the best of the bunch, but he was the best of the bunch. We were experimental <laughs> test pilots, uh, and he was uh, foremost among us uh, because of his flying experience with the X-15 rocket ship, which still today holds uh, speed and altitude records. He was a very intelligent man. He had wide uh, breadth of interests, uh, far beyond uh, NASA or the space program centering on history, probably the history of science. But uh, around, uh, we were very fortunate after the flight of Apollo 11 to have a around the world trip. And Neil was our, uh, our uh, spokesperson uh, at, for those occasions. And uh, wherever he went, he was a man of few words, but he had chosen them very carefully. He knew the background, 
of the country we were visiting. He knew about a, a lot about their people and their country. He, he welcomed, welcomed the audience to come with him aboard the spacecraft and fly with us. And I, I think he did that successfully. And uh, the thing that amazed me about it was that uh, I, I thought the, the reaction would be, well, uh, you, you, you Americans um, kind of finally went to the moon. Instead of that, it was, uh, we did it. We humans, we finally got together. We did something that is wonderful. We can all embrace it. North, south, east, west, rich, poor, everywhere we went, the, the reaction was, we did it. And I can't think of another achievement that has brought such unanimity of opinion about anything that we humans do here on Earth. It's an amazing irony because it was born out of Cold War rivalry. And in the end, instead of it being we won, it was like we all did it. And you get congratulations from the Soviet Union even. That, that is extraordinary, isn't yes, it? Yes, I believe it is. I know you talk about this sort of um, daisy chain of events that have to occur to make a mission successful. And uh, there are any number of variables, but in, in many cases, what NASA does is has, redu has redundancy or redundancies for redundancies. But I do know, I think you picked 11 spots along the way of Apollo 11 where you were most concerned. And one of them is um, what we're going to see a brief clip of right now. Let's roll the clip and we'll talk about the significance of this moment. July 19th. Apollo 11 slows down and goes into orbit around the moon. The bright blue planet of Earth now lies 238,000 miles beyond the lunar horizon. Astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin, now in the lunar module, separate from the command module. Astronaut Collins remains behind. Preparation for the lunar module descent to the moon now begins. So that moment when the lunar module separated from the command module, Columbia, the lunar module being the Eagle, and your two crewmates went off, that, that was a tense moment, and those, that, those hours when they uh, were on the surface were a period of time when you really sweated the details. Tell us a little bit about what was going through your mind and your concerns. Actually, the, uh, their separation from me and Columbia and their descent to the landing was not what was really foremost on my mind. Uh, I thought Neil would do a good job. He'd find a, a smooth, nice place to put Eagle down. And although he fiddled and diddled a little bit on some of the terrain he considered to be rejectable for one reason or another, he still found a beautiful landing spot with about 30 seconds of fuel remaining and put it down. <laughs> Uh, this I kind of expected. Uh, what worried me was the return. We, uh, we in NASA enjoyed uh, machinery that was redundant. Usually that we had two of something. Uh, not so in the case of the ascent engine, the engine that would bring uh, Neil and Buzz from the surface back up to me, coming by 60 miles above them. Um, that, that just had one, one small little combustion chamber that had to work properly or, or we had two dead men on the moon. And that was, I think, what was foremost on my mind. I had a long list of things to worry about, but uh, I think that was number one. That burn, that moment, pretty key. And uh, clearly the, the implications of it not working were uh, a solo trip back to Earth by yeah. you. And I assume you thought a little bit about that. You no, know, I did think a lot about it, and I'm sure Neil and Buzz both thought a lot about it. It was definitely not something we talked about. He, they knew, I knew, uh, uh, if, uh, if they couldn't get off for some reason, uh, there was nothing I could do about it. I had no landing gear on Columbia. I could not go down and rescue them. I either committed suicide or came home, and, uh, and, and of course, I chose to come home uh, in a situation <laughs> like that. I think that's that. a and, good uh, choice. <laughs> but uh, you know, I felt I'd be a marked uh, man for life, really, if I'd been in that situation. Well, what, do, what do you mean when you say you'd be a marked man? What do you th how do you think it would have played out? We don't have to go too far down that road, but well, I'm curious. I, well, I, I think people would have been sympathetic 
to, to my situation, and they would not have been critical of me, but for the rest of my life, they say, oh, that's that guy, you know, who left those two people to die on the moon. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would be tough. That would be tough. Let's, uh, let's go rewind the, uh, the tape just a little bit and go back to your uh, early days at NASA. Uh, you, uh, Air Force uh, fighter pilot and test pilot, came to NASA in class number three. You called yourself the 14, right? Yeah, so there were 14 of us. So it was the, the first, it was the seven, then the nine, and then the 14. Correct. So this is as they ramped up toward um, Apollo, and um, a lot of diversity in that shot, wouldn't you say? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? <laughs> a lot of white male test pilots in that picture, you oh, might say. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, yeah. No, no, I, I, I quite agree, and, and that seems like uh, an aberration today, and it, and it is, and in the future should be an aberration. But uh, it, it wasn't really NASA's fault, it was society's fault. Uh, and, and NASA uh, picked uh, graduates of an experimental test pilot school, there were only three of those around, uh, so the population available to, uh, to NASA was very limited. Uh, for example, NASA recently picked uh, 12 new uh, astronaut candidates, uh, and to narrow it down to 12, they started with over 18,000 applications. Uh, so do your homework, kids. <laughs> so totally different in, in, in my time. Uh, NASA picked graduates of experimental test pilot schools. At that time, uh, uh, NASA did not uh, hire uh, women to be uh, experimental test pilots. Uh, th there were one or two uh, uh, black candidates around, but uh, you know, in the flood of applications, they, they kind of got lost in it somehow. So that's what she ended up with. Uh, it was, however, I defend NASA in saying they, they were not on purpose selecting uh, white males. Uh, that was our society in those years. So t the decision to pick test pilots, I, I guess that makes sense, but they could have gone in other directions, couldn't they? Yes, of course, and they have gone in other directions, and I'm, I'm glad they should go in other directions. Uh, we were more concerned with the up and the down, getting these new machines into the air successfully, uh, testing them, uh, bringing them back down to Earth. Uh, and now is the, 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 that we've gone past that stage, and we're into, what are we gonna do up there? What's the science? What, what's going on? Why do people want to go? Uh, what can they learn? And uh, th that really has got very little to do with the upping and the downing that so <laughs> obsesses the uh, test pilot. So this, I believe, is a picture of you and some of your class doing survival training because, you know, God forbid if there was what we would call a downrange aboard or a landing in a location that wasn't the ocean near an aircraft carrier, you might have to survive for a few days in a place like the jungle. And I know you had the great opportunity to um, camp out and eat iguana, is that right? How Ch was it? Just like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, the, was the training, how much of the training did you think was kind of nutty and how much of it was worthwhile? Well, none of it was uh, out and out nutty. Uh, some of it was, uh, uh, some of it was, ha had give, been given a great deal of thought in, in the sense of suppose this goes wrong or this gadget breaks. And, uh, and, and that was what we spent a great deal of our time doing. Failure mode, we called it. Uh, um, but you can take failure modes to an extreme. You know, what if this does? Well, then you fix that, but while you're fixing that, the other thing goes wrong. Well, we kind of had a rule, we'll, we just can't go there. We're gonna only pick one horrible thing at a time and not try to bunch <laughs> them all up together. And inevitably, the thing that goes wrong is the thing you didn't think about, right? That's, it's, it's, yeah, what, what worries you most about a flight, you hit the nail on the head. It's that thing that you overlooked in your training. That's what we worried about. So let's talk about your first mission in space, Gemini 10. And by the way, do you pronounce it Gemini or Gemini? I've heard in the old days we used to say Gemini. I hear Gemini. What do you go with? No, I, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I do Gemini, and Tuesday, Thursday, <laughs> I go Gemini. <laughs> Gemini or Gemini, whatever you prefer. And uh, the great John Young was your, your crewmate on that one, who ultimately flew in Gemini, Apollo, uh, and the shuttle program for many years, flew six shuttle missions, an amazing career at NASA. Uh, but your mission on Gemini 10, you had two spacewalks. You're the first guy to do that. Uh, and um, 
as I understand it, there are, we don't have many pictures of that spacewalk. Tell us what happened when you were out there. Uh, I, I think you say I lost my camera. Is that what you're yeah, really that, yeah. <laughs> Details, <were> the, details. <laughs> uh. This was the best selfies ever, potentially, and there they are. They're still floating around, maybe. Who knows, who right? Knows, yeah. Who knows? Who no, knows? My, my job was to leave the uh, Gemini. Uh, uh, John was flying it in formation below, fairly close to it, maybe 20, 25 feet away, and I had a little maneuvering unit, a thing called, we call it a gun, because it sort of looked like a little pistol. You squirted gas out of that, and that allowed you to propel yourself. And so I had to propel myself over to the Agena, our target vehicle that had been up there for months, and, uh, and from it, uh, bring back an experiment package and return it uh, to the Gemini. And that eventually I did, but I had all kinds of, uh, of things which I indelicately call maneuvers uh, ass over tea kettle uh, <laughs> at, at the end of a 50-foot uh, umbilical before I was the second time able to get to where the package was and bring it okay back into the Gemini without a camera. And the camera, there, there you are. That, that must have been slightly disappointing. Of course, having done the space walk was probably made that a little easier to go uh, get through. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, we know so much now, 50 years later, how little was known about what you were going to accomplish. You had to rely on all kinds of simulations. Uh, we have a picture here of, I believe it's uh, Buzz and Neil, practicing gathering rocks on the surface of the moon. And I know you spent a lot of time learning geology that you wish you didn't have to spend time doing. But I do know this, uh, the number of simulations you did were extremely challenging. We're, we are talking, after all, about 1969 with key punches, you know, cards going into computers, trying to run simulators, simulators that would crash and so forth. When it came, as you got closer to that July 16th date for launch, which was set uh, by virtue of what the lighting conditions were going to be at the landing site, and you had to la launch in that time or wait another month, did you guys feel like you were ready? Um. I, I'm guessing that if you gave a crew six months, which is what we had, or a year, which most of them had, or two years, which some of them had, or even longer and later on years, uh, I suppose that uh, irrespective of that, the crew would say, well, you know, I had this notebook, I got 89 things checked off, but I still got 22 to go. The, 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 you, you never, I don't think, fully 100% confident that you know everything about what is going to happen or what might happen or might not happen. Uh, so I think, uh, I think most people would <laughs> feel like they could use a little extra time, and I'm sure we did also. Well, it's hard to simulate something that hasn't happened before. You have to, there's a lot of guessing that goes along with that, right? In the end, do you think the training matched pretty well? The simulators were, were extremely accurate uh, based on what we knew ahead of time. Uh, uh, some of, of their presentations, what you saw out the window, were not good at all. They were very crude. But in terms of uh, the, the uh, duplication of the instrument panels, and more important than that, uh, the software that backed up how those instruments would record good events, bad events, uh, questionable events. So, that aspect of the simulator training was, was crucial to us, and, and, and uh, hats off to all the engineers who put the, the long hours into designing those things. So when you think about what you did, the millions of parts, millions of subsystems, all from the low bidder, that gave you the Saturn V and the stack which got you to the moon and back, even if it's highly... Uh, effective and efficient and, and works as planned, e even a small percentage that still gives you thousands of possible failures with that many systems. Uh, do you still marvel at how well it worked? I do indeed. Uh, uh, the, the, those machines are, uh, look smooth and nice and on the outside. Inside they can, uh, they can be kind of a nightmare. I think in the uh, command module, a oh, design of one switch, one switch alone, I believe I had 300 of those switches. Uh, Presumably, I should know each and every detail about every one of the 300. Clearly, I did not, but uh, you know, I tried my best to learn a few of them anyway. <laughs> it's, it's, 
good to have Houston at the other end of the line, isn't it? Yeah. Occasionally you might need them. I want to show you this picture because, it, you know, almost well, every astronaut who goes to space has this um, sense of moving forward into the, the, the void, but also looking back at the planet. And you, of course, had this opportunity um, to see that, which is an, extra, an Earth rise. And I'm sure you remember the first moment you saw that happen. Uh, I'm curious, to what extent did you um, discover the moon, and to what extent did you discover this planet? Uh, on our way to the moon, uh, we, we didn't look at the moon. I know that sounds strange, but uh, we were worried about the constant sunlight hitting one side of our spacecraft and making it boiling and ruining the instrumentation inside. The other side would be minus 400 and some degrees and everything would freeze. So the solution to that was to turn sideways to the sun and rotate slowly like chicken on a barbecue spit uh, <laughs> a, uh, a, a, in that position we could couldn't see the moon until we got very close to it we rolled out then and looked at it oh my god it was awesome it was totally different from that little silver sliver that you see at night uh, from earth uh, it filled our whole window the big window too fairly big filled the whole window uh, very three-dimensional, it bulges, its belly bulged out toward us. Uh, the sun was behind it, and it cascaded all around the rim with this golden glow, which illuminated uh, the oceans, the flat part, the maria, and also the hilly, the craggy part, the uh, big and small craters. And uh, it was an awesome uh, spectacle. Uh, it wasn't a friendly one. So it didn't say go away, but it didn't say come in either. Uh, um, the moon did not beckon. It, it didn't beckon. Huh? But having said all that, having said all that, the moon was nothing compared to the Earth. The Earth was it. It was the the centerpiece. It was all there was. Uh, we had an emotional, I suppose, uh, rope attaching us to planet Earth. For whatever reason, it was what we wanted to look at. I mean tiny little thing, you could make it go away by holding your thumb out at arm's length, but if you put your hand down, whoop, there it was again, it wanted to be looked at. It, uh, tiny, as I say, uh, the blue and white colors primarily, the blue of our oceans, the white of the clouds, uh, little streaks of, uh, of uh, kind of a reddish tan, things that we call continents. Uh, very shiny, very bright, very beautiful, and, uh, and yet strange, though it may seem, uh, the overriding uh, quality, well, well uh, beauty, I guess I would say, but lurking right behind beauty was a sense of, it's fragile, it's a fragile little thing out there. The fragility of the earth, it was a response that I never would have suspected. I mean, I know it's made out of rocks mo mostly, but uh, it seemed very fragile. And the more you examine Earth, our planet, the more you discover that fragile is not a bad word. It is fragile. It's, it's fragile in thousands of different ways, uh, most of which are not uh, too good. Sometimes we humans don't seem like we really deserve to live on this nice little thing you see from a quarter of a million miles out. I want to pick up on that theme a little bit later in our program when we bring out the, the rest of our panel, but I'm, I'm curious um, about your thoughts on the space program. I know uh, when you, you, you said that you, you made the decision Apollo 11 would be your last space flight. It wasn't like you were hurrying back to the moon, but even in those days, you were like, let's go to Mars. Uh, and you've, you've, you've been very consistent about that over the years. Do you feel that that is still uh, something that should be a, a national priority, or for that matter, a global priority, to put human beings on Mars? And if so, why? Well, when I came back from Apollo 11, I used to joke that NASA sent me to the wrong place, uh, <laughs> that NASA ought to be renamed the National Aeronautics and Mars Administration. I even wrote a book one time, 20-some years ago, Mission to Mars. Uh, so I'm, what I'm about to say is uh, very one-sided. Uh, right now the uh, administration is uh, backing a return to the moon uh, as, a, 
as a waypoint, a jumping off point for planet Mars. Uh, and, and that has a lot of merit. My, my friend Neil Armstrong, who is a lot better engineer than I, thought that there were gaps in our knowledge when we prepared to go to Mars. It would be useful maybe to stop off at the moon and learn a few things, pick up some of the knowledge that we didn't have, and then go. Uh, however, I, I, I disagree with all the experts. I say that uh, I believe in the John F. Kennedy Express, if I could call it that, Mars Direct. If we want to go, let's do it. Let's put our resources into it. Let's pick a way of getting there. Let's get a schedule. Let's get the funding. Let's get the timing and so on. Let's, let's go to Mars. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, thank you. So you, uh, I've, you're, you're sort of the, I would call you the poet laureate of the Apollo astronauts. You, you have, you're a very eloquent writer and, and you speak um, uh, with, with great uh, authority, of course, on the technical detail, but you also can uh, capture what goes on in the right side of the brain. There is an expression, uh, of course, NASA has an acronym for everything, and uh, when it comes time for a spacecraft to go uh, from Earth to Moon, in other words, fire the rocket and escape the clutches of Earth's gravity, they call it translunar injection, TLI. Kind of a bore, right? You know, TLI. So, How do you pronounce it? <laughs> so, so he, Mike, I, I, I want to share a clip with people because you were the Capcom, which is the astronaut who speaks to the, the crew in space for Apollo 8, which was the first crew in history to have a TLI command. In other words, to leave the, the clutches of Earth's gravity and go toward the moon and be pulled in by Earth's gravity. It's a momentous moment. Let's listen to how this transpired in mission control for a moment, if we could. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, right, understand. We're go for TLI. TLI, Translunar Insertion. This was the commitment. Borman, Lovell, and Anders were ready for the maneuver that would send them to the moon. All right, that was a moment in history, and you said go for TLI. Is that all I said? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought, uh, I thought the president should be sitting next to me. The pope would uh, send a message. <laughs> Uh, Frank Sinatra would uh, dedicate a song, and instead of that, uh, I've got some translunar whatever you said, uh, and uh, TLI, and I'm, uh, ah. But I knew, I knew down inside that, uh, that, that uh, Frank Borman would rise to the occasion, so I was forced by the authorities to say, Apollo 11, you go for TLI. <laughs> he says, Roger Houston. That's it. That's all, <laughs> that's, that's all we said. You know, people watching at home might miss that moment. So here we are, uh, about 51 years post that moment. Here's your moment for a do-over. What would you say if you could do it again? Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I would ab abide by the NASA rules, which you can't, you, you can't say more than, I think, eight words in a row, and preferably they all be monosyllabic. But <laughs> under those conditions, I would say, Apollo 8, uh, the moon is yours. Go. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good do-over. All right, Mike Collins, we're going to bring out the rest of our panel. We're going to move into um, still history a little bit, but present day as well, the shuttle ISS era. Uh, let's launch into the shuttle era first. Five, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Houston now controlling. Atlantis begins its penultimate journey to shore up the International Space Station. Atlantis. Atlantis now in the proper alignment for its eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Four and a half million pounds of hardware and humans taking aim on the International Outpost. All right, let's bring out our additional panelists. First, uh, the uh, former commander of the International Space Station, 
uh, the only astronaut with an astronaut twin, the man who has done the longest stint in space for a U.S. astronaut on ISS, Scott Kelly. Thank you. Joining him is the only NASA astronaut who also played in the National Football League, and a man who somehow was able to sneak in his two dogs into his official NASA picture. To this day, no one knows how he did it. The coolest <laughs> astronaut we ever met, Leland Melvin. <laughs> so, I should tell you, I, I didn't get the memo on the NASA haircut today, I guess. Yeah. It's not too late. <laughs> Got some scissors should in Should we the back. do that right now? Yeah. Why not? Let's just get it over with. Now, here's the person you all want to talk to afterwards, because she will get you to space in the near term. She is the director of astronaut and orbital sales at Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' company that is working on all kinds of exciting things in space, sending tourists to space, going to the moon, and maybe someday going to Mars. Please welcome Ariane Cornell. Okay, so uh, Scott as the, is the longest tenured space traveler, with all that time in space. We, we, you know, we get glimpses of what it's like up there, and we read your books, which they're good, but they're just not carrying the fire, with all due respect. You know, I agree 100%. I recommend these books, but, you know. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they want to know uh, just kind of the simple questions, like what it's like up there. We see pictures of you guys playing with food and stuff and, you know, spinning around and so forth. What, what is, what's the takeaway? I, I know it's difficult to explain to people if you haven't been there, but what do you tell them? Well, you know, you, you, you try to share the experience with it. I'm fortunate enough to having got to uh, fly in space four times and spent over 500 days in space, but I, I trade all of that for what General Collins got to do here, of course. Um, you know, floating is fun. There's no question about it. It makes, <laughs> <laughs> but it makes just about everything harder to do, with uh, two exceptions, and that is moving things that are heavy, and also uh, getting your body into weird positions. If you had to like fix something or you know connect the uh, cable to the back of the TV. <laughs> <laughs> but the best part about it is it's really really challenging. It's a challenging thing to do, to fly in space, to live and work in space. And the best part about it is just that, having something that you feel passionate about, working hard at it, doing it as part of a team, and then being successful. So Leland, I, would you agree with what Scott just said about the idea that uh, a destination would be more fun than, than being in orbit? In other words, would you trade it all for a, a trip to the moon if you could? I think I would sign up to uh, Michael's JFK Express to Mars, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I, I think that destination piece will, will inspire you, will motivate you, you get the country behind it, and you do it. You just go do it. Would you guys do that one-way trip to Mars that was bandied about a, a few years back? I'm good. No. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> anybody here, would anybody do that one-way trip to Mars? Yeah. There's a few. You know All what right, I would I, do? You know, uh, I would do, Miles, yeah. is um, I would watch that reality show on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that one. I'm not sure I want to go with the people who want to go to Mars one way, right? <laughs> there's maybe something wrong in their lives. I'm just guessing. You know, there's, there's one thing about traveling in space. Your best mission, I think, is the people that you fly with. It's all about your crewmates. There's kind of a family that's built up, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mike, over the years, your relationship with uh, Buzz and Neil uh, you write in your book about how, you're, when you were together, uh, you, you had so many things to talk about that were of a technical nature that you often didn't get below the surface. Over the years, did it develop into a closer friendship, or did you maintain sort of a distance from each other in a way? Well, geography uh, prevented us uh, being really close uh, all the time. Uh, uh, Neil lived in uh, Ohio. Uh, Buzz was uh, out in California mostly. I live in Florida. But uh, we tried to stay in touch. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, I got to know Neil the best uh, during our around the world trip. 
and I really came to admire the, the many facets of the man, and I was so glad that he was picked to be the first on the moon. Yeah. You know, I was, I was shocked by the fact that for the most important space flight ever, they had only trained together for six months. And Isn't that, that was extraordinary? In the shuttle era, yeah. that, that, it's unheard of. You would yeah. think of at least two years of training, right? Would be about the norm or a year of anyhow, right? Yeah. Ariane, let's talk about the commercial component now. You know, the, the shuttle's gone now eight years. The shuttle was an amazing machine, but it, it, was, it was meant to be cheap and easy access to space. That didn't quite happen. As a matter of fact, not even close. It was actually pretty dangerous and expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in a different era now where we're thinking about um, lots of people going to space. Um, what's the big vision right now? Is it, is it, is it for people who can afford $200,000? Or I've heard Jeff Bezos and, and others, we won't mention competitors, but others talk about sending millions of humans into the cosmos. Is that, is that even a realistic notion right now? Yes, so in fact, our, our vision at Blue Origin is millions of people ultimately to be living and working in space. Um, that obviously is not happening tomorrow, um, and our, our motto at Blue Origin is something, it's gradatum ferocer, which in Latin means step by step ferociously. And that's how we're going to approach it. Um, and our first step at Blue Origin is a suborbital rocket called New Shepard, named after Alan Shepard, of course, the first American in suborbital space. And by the end of this year, we are going to be putting uh, tourists on board New Shepard. People like you and me um, are going to be going up in space uh, initially, you know, you're going to get three to four minutes of weightlessness, so maybe not uh, quite orbiting the Earth or the Moon, for that matter, yet. But our next plan is New Glenn, a big orbital rocket that's set to fly in 2021 that is going to be human-rated, uh, and ultimately we will be taking people to, uh, to uh, space stations, to the Moon, to Mars. You know, we're, we're really... Uh, a destination agnostic, if you will, but ultimately we will be taking many, many people to, the, to space. So Ariane, when you talk about taking many, many people, or maybe even one day millions of people to space, uh, what I think about is what just happened on Mount Everest. And uh, it can get crowded up there. It should, should, can anybody go to space? Should everyone go to space? And I want to get the astronauts to weigh in on that too. I mean, is there, should we set a bar, or are we reaching, is it, will there one day be a time when it, it'll be just as simple as getting on a commercial airliner? Well, the, the latter is our intent. I mean, you know, with, with New Shepard, you're going to be able to fly to space in what we call a shirt sleeve environment. So literally what you guys are work, wearing right now, you can come fly on New Shepard with, uh, uh, as in terms of clothing. And the other thing is that we're trying to open up space for as many people as possible. Uh, we want the training for it, even less than six months, it's just going to be about a day and a half. The intent, in fact, is to make it so that as many people can go as possible. So it will be like getting on a commercial airline. If you think about getting on an airplane today, you sit there, in fact, maybe you're on your iPhone even, and the, you know, the training video is maybe two minutes. Um, we, we, want, we want this to be, we're going to train you and make you feel comfortable, but we also want it to be uh, simple. And that's, that's important. All right, astronauts, what do you think? Can, Leland, why don't you go ahead? I, well, I, know, I know this is near and dear to you. You guys think about this a lot, because after right. all, you had to go through a lot of training to go there, and it's nothing to be taken lightly, at least as it is now. You know, I, I thought about what my aha moment would be in space before I left the planet, and I thought it would be when we install the Columbus Laboratory with a robotic arm, because that was my, my job and my primary mission objective. That paled in comparison to when Peggy Whitson, the first female commander, invited us to have a meal in the Russian segment. She said, you guys bring the rehydrated vegetables, we'll have the meats, right? She said that. <laughs> so we float over with this bag of vegetables. We get there, and it's African-American, Asian-American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander going around the planet every 90 minutes at 17,500 miles per hour. And I felt like I was at home. We were breaking bread with people we used to fight against, the Russians and the Germans. And when I looked out the window at Lynchburg, Virginia, my hometown, and then I'm thinking my parents are probably having meatloaf down there, right? Five minutes later, we're over Paris. Leo Eihartz is looking down. His parents are probably having wine and cheese or something. And Yuri's looking off. 
and his parents probably eating borscht in Moscow. <laughs> so in this very short period of time, we are celebrating all of humanity as we go around the planet. And that perspective shift that I got was my aha moment. And so if more people, if millions of people can get a chance to go to space and get this perspective shift that I got and get this connection back to the planet, I think it will advance our civilization, it'll advance our race, the human race, so significantly. So, my opinion. Yeah. So, Mike, if, if, I, uh, if I had talked to you in, um, after you got a, out of quarantine in August of 69, if I had asked you, can you imagine a day when that scene he just described happened will happen? Russians breaking bad with Americans, the diversity, the whole component on a space station. Would you have said that was likely? I think it, I think it could very well be. Uh, I, I, I hark back, as, as I say, to uh, uh, post-Apollo 11 around the world trip, everyone saying, we did it. Right. What color were they? Were they male or female who said, uh, we did it? Who's this we? It was we humankind. Uh, got all together, believe it or not, and actually agreed on something. We did it. I think that's a wonderful uh, moment to remember and to treasure. And we can have that, I say, world in my window. Uh, I transfer that to you, world in your window. Well, what is your world telling you about these things? You, you, can, have a, you can have a voice in it, small, but you can have a voice in it. You know, I think there could be a mission profile for just about anyone. And, you know, the, the entry point would be the suborbital flight. And I think you can probably fly, you know, 99.9% .9 of the population on that type of mission. Now, you take that a couple step fur steps further, and then you would have a flight like a shuttle flight. And that would be for, you know, someone maybe a little bit more, you know, extreme adventure-minded person. And then living in space, it's, you know, it's a challenging place to live, and it is not for everyone, but it's for potentially a lot of people. But I think, you know, in, in our future, we'll have a lot of different opportunities for that all of those collectively would be able to potentially include most of the population of the planet. So let, let's talk about long duration space travel, which you, uh, on this panel, have unique insight into. You uh, went to the space station for about a year, and uh, this was not just uh, an endurance test. There was a lot of science associated with this, and it helps the, uh, the science is helped by the fact that you have an identical twin brother who happens to be or was an astronaut, uh, Mark Kelly, who's now running for Senate, by the way, in, Ar in Arizona. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Got a, got a great uh, video. That's my brother it. cheering. At <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I told Scott earlier that he could help him on the campaign trail because who would know it was him campaigning? <laughs> twice, the, twice the campaign power right there. <laughs> so let's talk about a year in space, though. What, what, y there was some science that was done. What was, what was the point? What were they trying to get at? What did we not know uh, that we might have learned by virtue of you being up there for so long? So those people that understand science, and you may be a scientist or you just uh, you know, are interested in it as a hobby, you understand that for an experiment to be statistically significant, you need a very large uh, sample. So clearly, this is uh, a sample of one. There's only one sample, and that is my brother and I comparing uh, me in space with my brother as the control uh, subject on Earth. So the stuff we find from this experiment, which is a bunch of different things, is basically considered anecdotal information. It's interesting. It's something that you can look at and then um, decide that we need to investigate further. And there were a lot of um, results that were surprising. You know, uh, as an example, my, my telomeres, and the telomeres are the ends of our uh, chromosomes, and as we, uh, as we age, they get shorter and more frayed. It's basically, basically an indication of our physical age. And the hypothesis was me in space, uh, you know, the radiation, challenging environment, stress, or whatever, my telomeres would get uh, shorter compared to my brothers on Earth. Well, they actually got better. Now, some people 
thought that they improved because of the, you know, the restricted diet you're on, exercise, um, you know, a very controlled schedule maybe. But recently I found out there were also uh, some worms on the space station that their telomeres actually improved as well. Hmm. And the fact that I never saw them exercising, <laughs> <laughs> never once saw them on the treadmill or lifting weights. And also the fact that mine went back to normal pretty soon after I got back means there's some kind of genetic thing going on that we don't quite understand. Um, I also had some, you know, 7% of my uh, gene expression had changed. Uh, during the course of the year. So there are some genetic things we need to look at uh, further and investigate further, I think, as part of our, our plan to send people to Mars someday. Can I say something? Yeah. I, I just, uh, you know, hark back uh, just a, a few years before that on uh, Gemini, we were just amazed. We thought we were really reaching out. We thought we'd reach maybe the limit we sent two people up for 14 days. I don't think you'd unpacked in 14 days, <laughs> have you? <laughs> Probably didn't even use the bathroom. <laughs> 14 days. But if you've taken a look at a Gemini <laughs> spacecraft, 14 days in a Gemini versus a year on an ISS, I don't know. I, it might, be, uh, might have been a harder mission yeah, for those um, two. That, and they, they had very little room. Yeah. But uh, let's go back to that slide one more time because it, it talks about your cognition. How is your cognition anyway? You seem to be doing okay tonight. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of people uh, focused in on the fact that when I got back, my cognition declined. I pretty much improved throughout the mission. And I think that's a function of, you know, the longer you're in space, the more comfortable you feel. You, I never actually felt normal. I don't think anyone would ever feel completely normal. You always have the fluid shift to your head on the ISS, the CO2s, even when it's at its lowest, it's still high. The CO2 you could, bothered you on that? Yeah, yeah, and you can feel it. Yeah. Um, I could tell within, you know, a, a tenth of a millimeter what it was, and then mm. I could look and see that I was, wow. I was pretty accurate. So, you know, throughout the mission, you're, you're feeling better, never perfect. You're doing these tests over and over, so you're getting better at them. So I think that it was why my cognition got better. And then when I got back, I don't really think it was a, a, like a cognition deficit I had. I think it was more the fact that I just didn't feel well when I got back from Earth, back to Earth. And when you don't feel well, like imagine going to take the SAT if you had the flu. You probably wouldn't do well. Right. That's kind of, I think, why they saw a, a, a decline that was uh, noticeable when I got back. It was just a function of how tired I was and physically did, did not feel so, well. So let me get this straight. As CO2 rises, you get cranky and you don't feel well. So you, you were kind of a lab rat for the future of climate change in some respects, huh? <laughs> Tell you what, you know, when, like I said, with CO2 at its lowest, it's 10 times what it is on Earth on the, on the space station. Sometimes it's 30 times. So we're at like 415 parts per million. It's, it's 30, 30 times that, right? That's just, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, it's 10 times what it is okay, uh, ten at, at its lowest on, the, on, on ISS, and it is not comfortable. Huh. And that's just because they want to save the machines. They could, they could dial it so it's a little easier on you. But, yeah, you know, you know it's, a, it's partly resources problems. Yeah. You know, you, you don't want to use all your spare parts when the, you know, the supply chain is uh, not reliable. Um, <laughs> sometimes things <laughs> blow up. It's, it's hard to get to the Home Depot, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Leland, you also spent a good deal of your time as an astronaut in, um, in Washington. But not a lot of space flights there, but a lot of engagement with young people. And you, you headed the uh, education office for a time. I'm curious what your thoughts are, having had that experience of being in space and then and trying to reach out to young people, many of whom are in this audience. The value of space as a way to inspire young people. And teach them about things like climate change and CO2, right. for example, or little things like that, or, or what it's like to be in space, or telomeres, for that matter. How much value is there in that? I think it's extremely valuable, because it's one of those things where I would go into a classroom, and the kids love dinosaurs and space. And so if you can, if you can genetically make a dinonaut, you'd be golden, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the reason I have my blue flight suit, I, I got the memo to wear the jacket, but lots of times, you know, I got something on Facebook from a mother, Kelly, out there somewhere, who's bringing her eight-year-old son here to see this. 
And the suit for a lot of kids in communities that I go into would never imagine even thinking about going to space. And certain zip codes, they don't even know what an astronaut is. But I walk into that neighborhood with this on, and they ask the question, what is that? Where did you go? Who designed that? And that starts the, the, the exploration. And I think once we, you know, once we have their interest just a little bit, then you can start changing the way they think their mindset about what they can do with their lives. And representation, it truly does matter. Michael, you talked about earlier about how diverse that picture was not, and the, those original people, and how we've changed now in this day and age of who we're sending to space and who's representing you know, the future of, of humanity. And I think education is one of the things that you can get a kid inspired. My mother gave me a chemistry set when I was probably in middle school and it was age inappropriate, non-OSHA certified. <laughs> and I created the most incredible explosion in her living room. <laughs> Burned a hole in her carpet, and then she had a hand in my development, you know. She... <laughs> but my brain was activated. I majored in chemistry while playing football in college because of that one intervention. So if we can find in interventions, yeah. you know, using the space station, using Legos on the space station, going to Mars and letting kids see that they can get to Mars, it's, it's, that's the way, using space as a tool. Let's talk a little bit more about the commercialization of space. First of all, the uh, Blue Origin is just part of a big picture here. You've, you've flown 11 times now. Indeed. Uh, let's take a look at the most recent launch, which was earlier in the uh, first part of May, right? Let's watch it. So this rocket, this is New Shepard. Uh, the, the capsule and the booster lift off together in about 75 kilometers. The capsule separates from the booster and you go over 100 kilometers. So that view there is that's the beautiful view you guys are going to be seeing when you're up in space. The booster comes back down to land because we reuse the rocket. And then the capsule itself comes down under three parachutes. And just at the last second, we have a retro thrust system or basically like a, an air cushion that gives uh, you a nice soft landing. We also, as you saw in that film, we've done uh, quite a few um, uh, extreme tests on the vehicle to what we say, as we say, test the corners of the system to make sure it can work uh, in emergency situations or uh, in, in off what we call off nominal situations. And we're, we're getting very close to flying people. We're gonna be putting people on top of that rocket at the okay. end of this year. You wanna come flying with me? Excellent, no, we're, excellent. We're all, we're all in for that, for sure. Right on, but, excellent. So, uh, when you say soon, uh, I know it's hard to pin things. Are we talking about a year or less than a year from now? What are you thinking? So, we, our aim is to put people on this rocket by the end of the year. And Whoa. so, uh, we had another, uh, as Miles mentioned, the last flight was in May. It was the smoothest to date. We are, we are really hitting our stride. Um, but most importantly, we are not going to fly people uh, until, until the entire team is ready and we feel um, that we've, we've got a handle on the system. But we're getting close. I, I would jump on that rocket tomorrow uh, if given the opportunity. Um, we, you know, some of the tests that you saw there, we have an escape motor in the capsule. We've tested it on the ground. We've tested it at what we call max Q or the most um, aerodynamically uh, intense moment on the rocket performed perfectly, we performed it up at um, max altitude. I mean, things are going very well on the system, so. Awesome. So, it, it, it's not just about flying tourists, however. I know Jeff Bezos' vision is much grander than that. And he also, just within, I think, the past month or so, announced his, uh, his lander, which would go to the, Blue Moon, which exactly. would go to the moon. Tell us about Blue Moon and what his, goals are there. Uh, I was at this same NASA meeting I was at this morning. There was a lot of talk about Blue Moon as being part of the architecture of NASA's renewed interest in going to the moon sooner because they don't have a lander. And this project has been going on for a little while. You guys just don't, you're kind of secret uh, <laughs> about your projects generally. But let's look at what Blue Moon looks like and why don't you explain what the potential missions might be for it. Of course. So what you're seeing here, so this is Blue Moon, our lunar lander. Uh, the intent with this, uh, this craft is to take uh, about 3.6 metric tons to the lunar surface and eventually 6.5 metric tons. On the way to the surface of the moon, we can also uh, deploy small satellites and some other scientific craft to, to take data. And then the uh, blue moon itself will land 
on top of, blue, uh, of the Blue Moon Lander. We can take uh, rovers, we can take other craft and, and place them onto the lunar surface. So this, this uh, our Blue Moon program fits perfectly into uh, the administration's plans to land on the moon by 2024. We've been at it for the last three years, which is why we, can, we could jump to such um, uh, an aggressive timeline. We're, we're ready. And, and one of the, you know, I was talking about earlier, uh, gradatum ferociter, step-by-step ferociously, one of the reasons why we're going to be doing this, or we're able to do this, is that we've taught ourselves how to land rockets here on Earth, right. uh, which has six times as much gravity as uh, up on the moon. Um, so we, there are systems that we've been working on for a while that's going to enable Blue Moon. So there, there is a little bit of confusion about this when you get into this idea of commercial space, because the truth of the matter is NASA has never built a rocket. There's always been a contractor in the mix, uh, and it's just how the contracts are structured. NASA, in this case, might buy a service, get me to the surface and back, whereas in the days when you were you know, shepherding through that, uh, com uh, that uh, command module, you were in, on the factory floor every week making sure everything was connected in the right way. It, what are the pros and cons of, of that? It, on the one hand, it sounds like that would be safer because you're really paying attention to how the craft is built. On the other hand, you have less visibility into how it is built. What, what are your thoughts on it, Mike? Is, is it inherently safer to do it the way you did it back in the 60s? I don't know about the safety, but I don't think a dollar bill knows whether it's a federal dollar bill or a, or a commercial dollar bill. Uh, I don't know how you can say no to the overtures of Jeff Bezos and, uh, and, and uh, some others uh, to put part of uh, their private funds uh, to add those to the uh, federally appropriated uh, kitty, and you can do more with more than you can with less, and I, I, I welcome aboard. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. So the, what do you guys think? I, Scott, would you have any hesitation flying on whether it's a, a, you know, a Blue Origin craft or a SpaceX craft to the, to the space station or perhaps beyond? Would you do it? I would have hesitation flying on anything. Actually, uh, it is, which is appropriate, yeah, right? It is uh, very risky. Um, uh, you know, as we get more experience, it becomes less risky. So uh, I would want to learn about the rocket, understand the systems, the redundancy. But I think, you know, I could, I would probably, uh, having done that, absolutely fly on a uh, Blue Origin or a SpaceX rocket. I mean, they. I've been to Blue Origin, I've been to SpaceX. They, uh, those two companies both seem very, very professional, very talented people. But um, yeah, I wouldn't just jump on without understanding it because I want to come back. I like Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say we're not building this in a vacuum, but that, that has a different context at this panel. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we are, uh, you know, as people, we are standing on shoulders of giants. They're sitting on this stage with me. Uh, believe it or not, I'm having a hard time believing it. But, um, it's, we have, we work very closely with NASA. We take a lot of lessons learned from decades past. Uh, at Blue, we have uh, a really nice mix of um, veterans who have been in the industry for decades. NASA have, that astronauts. NASA astronauts. Yeah. You've got three veteran NASA astronauts uh, working at Blue, including the head of the New Shepard program. Um, so we, and we also have those that are coming out of, out of university. So we've got this really nice balance because we really, we really do believe that this company and these, these projects are going to be around for a while. So we, we are building uh, a system that's going to be the, the workhorse for the American space industry for decades to come. But the only way that we can do that is with really good relationships with NASA and with, uh, with those that have done it in the past. Yeah. Leland, how about you? Any hesitations? I think the, uh, the rewards outweigh the risk. When I, when I went to space on the shuttle, you know, it was the lowest bidder, right? I, I got there, and I undid my seatbelt, and I floated over to the window, and I looked out, and I was looking at the Caribbean Ocean, and I needed new definitions of the color blue to describe what I saw. And that also fundamentally changed me. And if we can get more people to share that experience back you know, back to the planet, you'll get more energy around exploring. You'll get more kids excited. You'll get more people doing things 
working together as one humanity. And that's how it's worth it to me to, to take the risk. Mike, I know when you were orbiting the moon, uh, you radioed down at one point, or, or maybe you're on your way back, but you, you said something to the effect, I wish you know, several hundred million Americans could have this experience with me. Right. How do you think that would change life on Earth? I, you know, I don't think you even, I don't think you have to go to the moon. I'd, I'd go up, uh, pick uh, uh, 100 miles is a nice uh, orbital. I mean, you're above all that friction stuff there. And uh, you, you've you got the, uh, the communist and the capitalist, and uh, they're side by side looking out a window. Hell, they can't even find their own country, much less say <laughs> that one is better than that one. Uh, I, I, I think it would, uh, in subtle ways, really change the uh, way political leaders think about their, their own turf and other people's, if, it, if you can divide turf into theirs and ours, uh, how, you, how you deal with things on a unified global basis. I think it would help. Yeah, my, my, uh, my guy I call my Russian brother from another mother, <laughs> Mikhail Kornienko Misha, my uh, guy I spent nearly a year in space, he, he would sometimes say on the space station, when we were there, you would say, you know, if our two countries wanted to solve uh, any differences, solve the problems we have with one another, all we need to do is put our two presidents in space together for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Leland, this idea, uh, it's been written about quite a bit. This idea of, it's called the overview effect. There is some, something that changes when people have this ability to, it, is that real? Uh, what is it about it? Is there something that really changes the way you view life when you get back down on terra firma, or is it just a fleeting moment in space and you're back to your everyday life? Well, before I went to space, I was driving down, I was driving from Houston down to Clear Lake on Highway 45, and this, driving my car, and this guy in this big pickup truck with the big mirrors and the dually cuts me off, and I, I go, blah, blah, blah. I probably say some things I probably shouldn't have said. <laughs> And then the same thing happened, but this time I was driving from Clear Lake to, to Houston after flying in space. And I just said to myself, dude, you can't hurt me. I've been to space. <laughs> and I, had, I, and I, I do feel like, I mean, Frank White wrote a book about this, you know, the overview effect, and it's a cognitive shift that people get when they see the planet from this vantage point. I feel like there was something cognitively that changed in me especially when I was breaking bread with Peggy and the rest of the team over there in the Russian segment. And it, it, it did feel like something, you know, fundamentally changed. Now, did you, did you feel that? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, and I would describe it um, a little bit more, you know, when you look at the Earth, you don't see any political borders uh, when you look at the Earth from space. Not like we expect to see it on, on a map. You think of Earth in terms of, you know, before you've flown in space, you think of how you view it on a map with political borders. Of course, you know, you could see those at night uh, with the, the lighting in different countries. But during the daytime, you don't. You see an incredibly beautiful planet. Uh, you know, because you follow the news, that there are a lot of bad things that go on on a daily basis on planet Earth. Uh, and these are... Th problems that are solvable. When you're on the space station, this $100 billion space station, probably one of the hardest things we have ever done. Uh, if we can do that, you recognize we can you know, do other things to help humanity. Right. The other thing you notice is just how fragile the atmosphere is. It looks like a thin film over the surface of the Earth. When we're on the ground, you look up, the sky looks infinite. When you're in space, I remember one of my first days in space, I was like, what is that film? And then you realize that is our atmosphere, Just the where all the pollutants are going into. You know, there's some parts of the Earth almost always covered with pollution, parts of Asia. I think, you know, kids in those countries, if you ask them what color the sky was, they'd probably say brown or, or wow. gray. You know, the rainforest in South America, I noticed a, a very, very obvious change between my first flight in 1999, my last in, in 2016. You know, fires over certain parts of the uh, mm -hmm. continents. You, you see the effect of people that have, how people affect this planet, which is incredibly beautiful, but also incredibly fragile. 
I think we, we talk about fragility of the planet, but I, and I, I hear what you, both of you have said about the fragile oasis, but I, I think that it's not that the planet's fragile, it's that we are screwing it up and that we're gonna be burped out and the planet will be resilient and oh, yeah. fix itself later. Yeah. So we're, we're doing it to the planet and doing it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's gonna be us. One of, so really the, the reason why uh, Blue is so focused on these reusable rockets we talk about is to uh, access the resources of space, but it really is to help Earth. So it's bringing the resources down, but ultimately part of our grander vision is how, how do we get heavy industry off the planet? How do we get these pollutant uh, uh, elements and industries off and maybe use Earth just for residential and maybe some light industry? Space has a lot of, it might sound far off, but the moment that we're gonna hit that, that oh, oh gosh moment, it's gonna to be too late to work on the technologies that are gonna be necessary to get us up there and get back and, and bring resources back and get some of these, uh, um, again, infrastructure up into space to help us here on Earth. There should not be a plan B. We've been to every single one of the planets and this one by far is the best. So we ought to do what we can to keep this one happy and healthy. Yeah. So Mike, uh, I know you've had similar, uh, it's had a similar effect on you and ma made you very concerned about the environment. Tell us a little bit about how your view of the Earth, that Earth rise and being able to cover up everything you know with your thumb, how that changed you as uh, you lived out the, the last 50 years? Not, not, hadn't changed me enough. I, I haven't done a particularly good job in the last 50 years of uh, putting my, uh, my footprints or uh, my, my bank account where my money is, I mean, where my mouth is. Uh, uh, I, I think we can, I don't think I'm rare in that. I mean, we, I think we talk a good game. I'm not sure we play a good game. Uh, I, I certainly have not. I, uh, I, I pursue my own uh, hobbies and whatnot without really giving consideration of uh, sufficient consideration to uh, the fragility. And, and, um, and, and, and of course, uh, you're absolutely right about the, is, is it really fragile or are we fragile people living on a rock? Uh, not sure that it matters. Something is fragile, right. the system is fragile. Right. And uh, I, I certainly worry about that. The, the word fragility just floats in and out of my head whether I want it or not. Isn't that what you're writing about right now, though? Tell us a little bit about it. Um, well, I'm, I'm writing uh, um, book number five. It's a series of essays, and uh, one of them touches on what we're talking about, which is uh, world population. Well, uh, what should the world population be? Ken Sabe, uh, is anyone working on trying to find an answer to that? I don't think so. There's, there, you know, there are organizations, international organizations, but uh, they, they write uh, learned papers that they pass back and forth between half a dozen people, and, uh, and their, their, their conclusions don't ever seem to reach uh, the politicians. Uh, uh, when we flew to the moon, the world population was two billion, and uh, now it's, uh, I think, around eight. Predictions are it's gonna fairly soon be 10. And is, is that sensible? Is that okay? Well, maybe. I don't think so, however. But, but my main point is not whether I think it's too big, too small, or just right, but that no one is paying the attention to it that nations should pay. Uh, and it's a, an extraordinarily difficult uh, uh, problem because well, we all know the diversity of north, south, one factor after another, but somehow we have to get all these uh, competitive uh, countries together to try to at least plan on where are we going? Where, what do we want it to be next fiscal year, 10 fiscal years, whatever? I think we should be working the problem and we're not. So, well, we face this time of kind of peril and promise. The, the promise is a lot of the excitement we, we hear here and, and how space can help us in ways. But it, it, does space at some point become frivolous and, and a waste? Or will it always be some means towards solving problems here? 
I think the latter, but I, you know, I, I, might, I might be a bit biased on that. But no, I mean, you are, you are literally looking into infinity, right? This image that you're looking here. The, the amount of resources that we, can, that we can access and use and enhance. You know, if, if we're looking at a, ultimately a population cap, we're, we're walking towards stasis. That's sad. Humanity is supposed to expand, is supposed to evolve. I mean, how, how you know, think about things just plateauing or even going backwards. That seems, yeah, that just makes me sad. I think we, we will continue to look to space and what it has to offer for our future. Scott, how important is space in, in the picture when you think about the problems we have here on the ground? So, I, you know, for one, it's a, a technology accelerator. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not a, not a believer that if it wasn't for Apollo, we wouldn't have cell phones right now or the, we wouldn't have computers. But I well, think... Well, space food sticks and Tang, for sure. We got that. <laughs> so, yeah. And we do have the space ice cream, yeah, which yeah, okay. we actually so don't even have we got in space, believe it or not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, I think, you know, doing the hardest thing we can do uh, requires us to develop technologies to do that. And I think that improves our, our lives here on Earth. Um, I also agree that we are explorers, and as soon as we uh, stop uh, exploring and we look inward, we're probably not going to exist for very much longer. I think that is part of our DNA, uh, to always want to see what is uh, over the horizon, whether that's the horizon of, uh, of the ocean or the horizon of the moon or eventually Mars. But if you made the argument that everything I just said was wrong, and the only thing we got out of spaceflight is that kids in this country or around the world were motivated to become scientists and engineers, to do their homework, to work in fields that are incredibly important to our, our economy, incredibly important to our national security. If the investment alone just got us motivated and moving in a, in a, in a positive direction, towards developing scientists and engineers, I think every penny is well yep. uh, worth the, the expense. And the, and the last thing is, you know, I spent over 500 days on the International Space Station. There's no money there. All that money was spent on Earth, you know, with people in, with high paying jobs, uh, good jobs, people that then, you know, go on to pay their taxes, to send their kids to college. So, I think it's an investment in our future in you know, many, many different ways. Leland, would you go along with that? I agree with Scott, and I, I just think that this, you know, this wiring of us in our DNA to explore is one of the biggest things that we do with space, whether it's the oceans or space. And when I was interviewed to become an astronaut, there were 2,500 people that applied. I was one of 25 U.S. astronauts chosen and right before I was chosen, John Young turned to me and he said, Leland, if we stop exploring, we will falter as a civilization. And so I believe John Young. And I know that if we stop doing this, we're going to die as a civilization. The other thing is, you know, Scott, you just said, I, I had a chance to talk to a kid when he was 16 years old at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory wearing this blue flight suit. And I gave a commencement speech at George Mason, and this young guy walks up to me and he says, hey, do you remember me? I'm getting my PhD in aerospace engineering because you told me that I could. <laughs> That's one kid. So if we can do this, maybe that kid's not gonna fly in space. Maybe they're gonna cure cancer, or maybe they're gonna get in some other field and build your rockets or, or something. But this hope, this inspiration, this leadership is something that I think we have to do. Whether, wherever the exploration goes, we must explore. Should we go back to the moon? Should we press toward Mars? How much does that matter if it's about inspiring young people? Is it, it, will any mission do? I think, uh, I think going to Mars is showing, I mean, what President Kennedy said back in the day, it's because we do the things that are hard. And we've been to the moon, we've demonstrated that. Do we need to have a, a lunar base as a, as a launch pad to get us to Mars? I don't think so. But if we decide to do this as a civilization, as a people, let's put the money up there and do it, and go do it, just like Kennedy did. 
What do you think? Move? You know, there, well, there, I think there are probably some teenagers in here, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Stand but, up. Stand up teenagers. But uh, <laughs> All teenagers say, yeah. yeah. The Mars generation, yeah. right there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 But I don't know. We're glad you're here tonight. I don't know if you I don't know if you realize this, but but you guys have never been on the earth with all the people. Your whole lives there there has always been people in space. And I think one of the things we should make a commitment to is never changing that. I think no matter what we do, and someday we will have to put the uh, International Space Station or at least parts of it in the in the Pacific Ocean. I think we should make a commitment to always having people in space and at least that keeps us moving in, the posit in a positive direction. You know, someday we're gonna go to Mars. I hope I get to see it. I hope you guys get to do it. Uh, maybe we should go back to the moon. I think that's a choice, depending on, really, about how much money you have money. to invest. Right. But I think the planet needs to make a commitment to always have people in space. We got a 20-year record. Don't want to break it. <laughs> All right. So, I'm just gonna go down the panel, starting with Ariane. Paint the vision. It, it, uh, 50 years from now, when we come back and do this event again, and we'll all be here, <laughs> what will we be, where will we be in space, you think? What's your prediction? Uh, I mean, I think that, um, I think that there are going to be a lot more people in space. I think that's going to be driven by the improvements in uh, reusable rockets that are going to be able to get people, uh, and again, you know, space stations or other sorts of heavy infrastructure up there. Um, and I think it's going to, as we're seeing here, uh, touch a lot more people's lives um, through various elements of space technology, whether it's people actually getting up into space or them being able to benefit from the technology that's coming from space. Will there be millions by 50 years or thousands or hundreds? I don't, think, I don't think necessarily millions. That vision of millions of people living and working in space, you know, is it my grandchildren? Is it your grandchildren or their grandchildren? We'll see. We'll see. And in fact, I think, frankly, the future is, is to be written by them. Right. So we can predict all day, but it's the young people in the audience and, and you know, it's the future generations that are going to make, that are going to paint the picture. All right, Leland, 50 years from now. 50 years from now, I'm inspired. These students that stood up, these kids that stood up, a lot of these kids don't see race and don't see color and don't see isms. So I am very hopeful that in 50 years, some of those kids will be orbiting Mars, working together as close-knit teams with their friends and family and people from all around the planet. Um, I think it's possible if we as a society decide that this is important. And you know, my experience on the space station, working with people from around the world, it, it, it changed me. And I think they're already changed in the things that they do and the, tweeting and texting and IGing and all of this connectivity, even though sometimes it's a little too much, but, um, but they will make it there and will be in Mars. Whether it's on the planet or orbiting, it's Mars. Scott. Well, I uh, agree mostly with what, what my two colleagues here just said. And if you consider the fact that we went from flying an airplane for the first time in 1903 and then, um, General Collins here and Neil and Buzz uh, stepped foot on the moon on Apollo 11, uh, what was that, 66 years later? I mean, if you think about that, you know, advancement in technology in just barely over 50 years, what our, our potential is. Now, whether we, you know, use that potential to create a, a space industry that is vibrant, that have have a, a lot of people uh, having access to space, to going back to the moon and Mars, I don't know. You know, if you consider the fact that there are going to be people in the U.S. Air Force flying the B-52, that's going to be 100 years old <laughs> at one point. People will be flying a 100-year-old airplane in the U.S. Air Force. Nothing against the B-52, but, I mean, you can see how you can sometimes just kind of get stuck and keep doing the same thing. And I hope we don't wind up there. Mike, uh, we'll, we'll end it with you. I want to modify the question. You have a two-part, you have a bonus question. <laughs> uh, in addition to uh, the question I've asked everybody else, I want to have you first answer. If I asked you this same question 50 years ago, what would you have said? 
No, I don't want to answer that one. I want, <laughs> <laughs> I, All right. <laughs> I, I, want to, uh, I want to say what 50 years from now will break. Go ahead. Yeah. And, uh, you get to do what you want. And, and Absolutely. I, I don't know. I haven't a clue. But I think you will figure it out. I think the young people today are smarter. There's, you guys are men and women, black, white, whatever. You're smarter than I am. You'll figure it out. You, you have, you're working from a, a, a bigger database, part of that, thanks to the space program, most of it not. But you'll, you'll, you'll work it out. I'm very optimistic uh, that uh, your, your future, that you will chart as time goes by, is better than the future that I would perhaps predict right now. All right. Good place to end it. Mike Collins, Scott Kelly, Leland Melvin, Ariane Cornell. Give it up for them. Give it up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Great conversation.